Ryan. One sec, one sec. Oh, sorry. Hey guys, I think I know most of you by now. My name is Brian, uh, PhD student at Santa Barbara. Um, and my project involves watching trees grow over time. Uh, what I did was use remote sensing data fusion to kind of look at above ground biomass. And ideally, I will look at how this changes over time. And so just to provide you a little background um, for this project, uh, we all know that humans are really good at cutting down trees, <laughs> trees which contain a lot of carbon, carbon which is really important for climate change, stuff like that. Um, but we're also really good at growing trees. Like every year, millions of hectares of trees are planted, especially these two species. Well, one species here and another species on the right, uh, Pinus radiata, which is Monterey pine in eucalyptus globulus, which is blue gum eucalyptus. And these two tree species account for more than 30% of all trees grown globally. And if we could narrow down kind of the carbon estimates of these two species, I think that would put us that much further ahead in global carbon accounting. And so guiding my research, um, especially for this project is, can we apply machine learning and remotely sense data to improve estimates of above ground biomass at a countrywide scale? And given the unique data set that we have access to, does deep learning outperform other methods? Methods such as gradient boosting, random forests, and traditional growth models. And so I'll just outline my approach for this summer school. Um, first was just gathering data and ground data from my partners. I then created training masks and image pixel chips which then went on to feed the di different models that I used, including a uh, land cover classification and above ground biomass models. Finally, and I haven't done this yet, but I will compare the various models that we produce. Um, let's see what happens. And then we will profit. <laughs> 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 And so my project focused on Chile, uh, the country, as opposed to the plant. <laughs> um, and what I did at the very beginning of this project was to create data cubes and just stacks of remotely sensed data. And I used four sensors for this project, uh, two SAR sensors, Allos Palsar, which is a Japanese sensor at the L-band, in Sentinel-1, which is a European SAR sensor in the C-band, and then Landsat and Sentinel-2, which are two optical sensors. And I combined these into like these massive multi-dimensional arrays. And for this project, we partnered with Arauco, which is the largest Chile or timber producer in Chile. And this is again, my study area. And all these little shape files are parcels that they own. And they've collected like reams of forest metric data over these parcels almost on an annual basis. And so here's an example of what some of these parcels look like that I then use for training data. And these are all individual parcels that I then use to split into train tests, which I'll get to a little later. Um, but then within these parcels, we have data, including mean DDH, which is diameter of a tree trunk at breast height, canopy height of the trees within these parcels, and stand density, how many trees are within each parcel. And we need these three metrics to eventually calculate above ground biomass. So I then, in my second week here, created my trained test data, um, this came in the form of 1,000 image chips, as seen here. Um, and the arrays, or these are multidimensional arrays, 0 through 10 being the data, and 10 through 13 being the labels that I use. 
I then created uh, land cover classifications using just this very basic off the shelf random forest. This will let us focus and zoom in on the forested pixels and kind of ignore like water or crops or grass or, or cities. And something I'd love to check out in the future is whether deep learning could produce like a more accurate view of land cover classification. But that's a future brand problem. <laughs> in terms of the above ground biomass model, the inputs included mean dbh, canopy height, and stand density. Um, and the output would ideally be predictions of these three metrics. I used a regression model based off a unit backbone from PyTorch. And the final layer being a ReLU function with an L2 loss function, um, mean square error due to the regression. I also tried using Torch Geo, uh, Torch Geo as a code base. Um, I think Felix had more luck than I did in getting it running. I eventually dropped it like two days ago. So <laughs> good on you, Felix, for sticking with it. <laughs> and we actually like started two training things, but they did not work, unfortunately. Um, as you can see, I eventually just got like NANs as loss values in here. I have a loss of 97 million. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, like I know exactly maybe what went wrong. Um, I do need to do quite a bit of data cleaning. Um, I, it turned out yesterday that I wasn't normalizing my data correctly. Uh, also, I'm looking forward to incorporating like hyperparameters, uh, data augmentations. Um, and for this project, I only looked at 2019, uh, but I'm hoping to incorporate the last like 30 years of data that we have access to. So I think that would really go a long way and improve the model. In terms of future work, again, creating more data from past years is a priority. Um, I think it'll be really exciting just to train and run different models in tons and tons of different models. Uh, additionally, I am looking forward to improving the documentation. I feel like for so much of the summer, I was just focused on training the model and, and getting it running that I kind of let everything else fall by the wayside. Uh, and additionally, incorporating additional training data or uh, additional remote sensors. Just because we have access to so much remote sensor data, I, like why not? Um, and finally, I would love to introduce like a time series element to this work because we have decades worth of data. Like it would be neat to see like literal growth of biomass. Key takeaways from this summer. Um, I felt super productive during this time here. And I just started this project like a month, two months ago. And I feel like we just pressed fast forward on this project <laughs> and like speed warp. And so that has been really cool to see. Um, I think one of the most valuable aspects of this project or of, of the summer school was like the resources that we have access to that I was not aware of. Like, I didn't realize that people just use pre-trained models <laughs> and like just changed like a couple layers. And so that was kind of mind blowing to me. And like code bases, I didn't even know that was a thing. And so that was nice. Um, I really admired um, how folks in the CS sphere manage projects um, and in run projects using all the tools that they have access to. So Jason and, and Benny's lectures were really helpful in just like introducing me to these tools that make any project more efficient. And instructor and TA experience. I think we've all been in a situation where what would have taken us like two days to debug 
took Bjorn or Benny like five minutes. <laughs> um, and that's happened so many times. I wish like I had Bjorn like on my shoulder as I was doing it. <laughs> all the time. You're welcome to join. Um, and finally like yeah this stuff was was really hard to do um and it was kind of a black box for me but if anything this course has taught me that there it, it is doable and there's like a lot more going under the hood that we can understand um and so that's been really cool to see so um, finally, I'd like to just say thank you to Caltech and Sarah for like being awesome, awesome hosts, uh, Bjorn and the other instructors for your helpfulness and uh, the Sky team for just like being so collaborative. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, anytime you see lost values in the millions, it probably means your data is not normalized correctly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's usually a good sign. Um, but I, I think one of the things that's really exciting for you, I think, for this project is that you knew you were going to be working on this for the next two years. And so it's so cool to know that now you're like jumping into it feet first. Yeah. Okay, right. question. Uh, I just wanted to know how much of a pain is it to get your like tiles from different satellites to like overlap is that awful i assume that's awful <laughs> yes and no um luckily google earth engine is like god's gift to mankind <laughs> <laughs> and it has helped so much in the pre-processing of a lot of remote sensing data and eventually just like merging these data sets to like really easy to operate arrays um and so that's that's certainly helped and there's so many great scripts that scientists have put together um to do that and so that's taken a lot of the legwork out of it for for folks like us so um. what's your plan when you think about going back 30 years for the bands <laughs> that don't go back 30 years like so right now you have SAR mm -hmm. in, included in your most recent data but those bands only go back maybe to 2013 years. yeah yeah exactly yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And that's something that we've kind of been figuring out because um, we do have Landsat back to like the, the early 70s. And so we're hoping to use in some way Landsat as like, a, I don't know what one would call it, like a base to kind of back model TBD. But um, <laughs> if you have any great ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, that's something that that we're still trying to figure out. Because um, yeah, we could probably easily back model to 2013, but beyond that, will be really interesting to see. I guess you could train models for the recent data with like with only Landsat versus with the new SAR band. See what the differences are. Figure out if you could measure the types of uncertainty, and then mm -hmm. just incorporate that uncertainty going backwards into your eventual biomass models. Absolutely. And yeah, that's the interesting thing is we have ground data going back to, in some parcels, like the 20s and 30s. It's amazing. And uh, like the 1920s. And so um, taking advantage of that, just all these disparate data sources and merging them is, it's tough for my brain to think about. So... Ryan, yeah, you say you have such a cool, rich ground data source to work with. I wonder, do you have any information on the sort of accuracy or sort of how much variability there is in the way that these things are being measured? And so if you're taking like a sand level and measuring, trying to extrapolate up to like a forest or a parcel level um, and year to year, like how much of what you would, would be looking at would be just like change from year to year or change from like observer to observer, that kind of variability. Absolutely. That's a great question, Rachel. Um, one really awesome thing about working with industry professionals such as these folks are that they're they're really rigorous in their standards because ultimately they're like profit driven. And so they need good values and good estimates of how much timber they have. And so it's, we found very little variability over time for the more recent data sets. Um, and they base their like forest inventory models off of the US Forest Service who has really rigorous methods as well. 
And so we haven't found that to be a huge problem after 2013. Before 2013 and before different years or between different years, we see a bit more variability. And so that's something we'll have to try to account for. But thus far, I've only been kind of using more recent data. So again, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Cool. Uh, Wendy, we got one more question and I do want to Yeah. Do you expect the SAR inputs to generalize across forest types? Like most of your data is eucalypt and pine, and, but it would be really interesting to try to show some form of generalization of this method to other forest types. And I wonder if maybe SAR to height prediction could be one of those variables that might generalize across forest types. Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, I've only been focusing on pine and eucalyptus thus far. We do have access to native forest fetch, um, data. And so that will be interesting to see what like the SAR signature and how that varies between different tree types. Um, I haven't looked into the weeds on the differences yet, but I do know that SAR signature is different between pine, which has like a profile of this and eucalyptus, which is more like returns more backscatter in the C band. Um, and so this is why I'm using a number of different SAR sensors. C, which doesn't penetrate canopy. L, which penetrates canopy and hits like fronts and returns backscatter. And so um, I think this is one of the reasons why it's good to use a number of different SAR sensors, not just one. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Great. you so much, Brian. Thank you.